Morning, everybody. Dr. Robin McKay here, and welcome to this week's episode of Mindset RX. It is your place to be if you're an emotionally intelligent leader and you're ready to set the tone for a positive, purposeful, and productive week. And it's Thanksgiving week here in the US, but it's always a good time to give some gratitude and appreciation for our lives, our hearts, our careers our families, our communities, and so on. So I always say that gratitude is the first cause of all good things. So I want to encourage everybody to take a little bit of time today, just as we get started, to come into a place of gratitude. So like I do every week, let's go ahead and just take a second and unplug from everything else. Just make sure that you're giving yourself this time and space to listen, even if you happen to be multitasking, just setting your intention to pay attention on purpose right here, right now. Put your hand on your heart for just a second and take a deep breath in. I always close my eyes unless, of course, I'm driving. And then, of course, I don't. So just breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in love and gratitude and breathe out everything that doesn't serve you. And just do that a couple more times. And pull your shoulders down and back. And now we have arrived. I want to welcome everybody. And I have a special guest today. You'll see a split screen, of course. I've got my friend and colleague, Cindy Rodriguez. Come on. Um, I just said your husband's name. Constable. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's all good. <laughs> um, I was looking at your beautiful face. I haven't seen you in person for so long or virtually in person for so long because you've been traveling and you're the, the entrepreneurs who are traveling around the world right now. I know you're back home in Florida for the holidays. So it's good to have you here. I want to share with everybody a little bit about Cindy and why I thought it was important to have her join us this week. So Cindy is in the business of helping leaders break the mold. She's the co-founder of RGIC, an agency that is focused on the powerful world of content marketing using major publications. To date, RGIC IC has helped over 2,000 entrepreneurs become contributors to over 100 of the largest population. They've taught companies how to implement content marketing strategies and tactics that create more engagement, build a strong online presence, and increase sales. She's also a featured contributor with Entrepreneur.com, CEO World, addic and Addicted to Success, among a lot of others. She's an editor for the Good Men Project and has delivered a TEDx talk. And she, I consider Cindy one of my dear friends and colleagues in this online space. And I'm so honored that you're here with us. But let me just set the, set the stage for this. A couple of weeks ago, I produced a podcast and LinkedIn Live on the topic of what's hot and what's not in leadership. And I was speaking specifically around tech, healthcare, fintech, just whatever's going on in the world, especially for women leaders. And I posted on LinkedIn, just a question to my colleagues, like, what's going on in your world? What are you seeing coming now and in the future? And Cindy, you had something really important, impactful to say. So I want to welcome you to the show. And maybe you can just kick things off with your response to my query about what's hot and what's not in leadership now and in 2022. Absolutely. Thanks, Robin. I'm excited to be here. And yeah, we're currently home. Normally, we're globe trotting around the world, but we're home for the holidays. Mm -hmm. And so I thought your question was good, you know, and this is kind of a topic that comes up every year, right? What's what are we going to see in the new year? You know, what are the business trends? What are the leadership trends? What are the fashion trends? All the things. And for me, what I thought was going to be poignant, especially with the ushering in of kind of the new age and all of the work that light workers are doing on the planet today is what ha like what next? What happens above the glass ceiling? Because there's mm -hmm. a lot of talk and a lot of content around climbing the ladder, uh, breaking the glass ceiling, getting a seat at the table, you know, depending on whether you're, you know, in a, a job or if you're in entrepreneurship, you know, everyone's striving for that seat at the table. Then for me, what I think is important is, well, what happens then? Now that we've busted through and we have the seat, what do we do now? What does that look like? And especially from my vantage point, being a woman of color, what does that look like for me? Because obviously my journey to that seat is different than would your journey be. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which I can continue to make 
waves or disrupt the status quo is going to be different. So that was to me, what was really going to be a topic of conversation going forward. I am so glad that you brought that forward. And it really resonated with me. One of the things that I've said when I work with women leaders who are mostly at the VP level and above, but a lot of them will come in when they get their seat, when they've gotten their promotion. In fact, I remember where I even got this phrase, a woman in tech called me the day she got her promotion to vice president. And she said, Robin, I just got promoted. I need your help because I want to use my seat at the table for good. And so she was very purposeful about what she wanted to do there. And yet there is a risk that we run when we get our seats at the table. Now you're a member of the club. Yeah. And you're, you're no longer, <laughs> you're, you're an insider and it changes things, right? It, it changes your psychology, it changes your relationships, it changes your relationship to power and privilege. It also changes your relationship to the people who used to be, and they're still your colleagues, but they're at a different level. So you have different responsibilities. Can you, I wanna just back up just a second because I wanna give context for why you are specifically concerned about this from your own vantage point with your education background training and expertise. Can you just share a little bit about where you came from so that our listeners can get that context? Yeah, so I spent 28 years in the corporate and government finance arena. So, you know, master's degree, I was a finance officer. Um, when I retired from the city, I had been in government finance for gosh, almost 20 years at that point. So I was at the table at that point in my career for many years before I retired. And the climb there, you know, throughout the years is very different. Finance happened to be a very male dominated industry. I started out in the brokerage world, extremely male dominated industry. And, you know, I didn't, at my entrance into that world, my manager at the time had told me that I needed to basically use that I was a good looking woman and my sex appeal to get business, that I needed to shorten my skirt and, you know, show some cleavage and work that on the golf course. Okay. I have to raise my hand here. <laughs> <Could> you imagine? <laughs> I'm I just 25 see... and I'm like, I'm sorry, what? You want me to do what? I, I, my head's about to explode here. And I know that most women have stories that are oh. similar to yours and that's not to dilute yours at all, but let's give context too. So what, what year we're not talking about, you know, 1983. No, what it was year? 1996. Okay. 96. You're 25 and you're getting told that you need to use sex appeal and all right. Yeah. And he, in fact, told me, you know, when he had called me into his office and asked me if I knew why he hired me and I was like, oh, because I almost scored perfect on the series seven. And he was like, no, I didn't know that. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he said, I hired you because you're a looker and men are going to throw their money at you. Oh, Oh. And so here, okay. you know, to this point, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've done all this to be smart and successful. And you hired me because I'm pretty. So it was like, congratulations on your face. I'm sorry, what? Which, you know, kicked off a long yeah. career of those types of comments. And I'm really, I'm reflecting because you and I are contemporaries. We're about the same age. Mm -hmm. And so that was 95, 96. That was before the sexual harassment uh, awareness movement really Absolutely. came into play. That was a couple of years later. So, and you and I were at, in our own ways at the fore of that. In fact, I remember going to my human resources officer at the company I was working with, they were delivering sexual harassment training. And I was like, do you think we could add awareness to this? Yeah. Because otherwise, <laughs> like, what are we doing here? And, you know, yeah. they were very the once a year required yeah. training, yeah. which started out as biannual required training. Right. Once every right. Two years, you watched a video of some overt sexual behavior. Right. You're like, that's not how it happens. What no, are we doing here? No. So flash forward, when you left your leadership, your seat at the table, what level were you at and how much were you, how, I want to just give some dollar amounts to what give, I know I said that so inarticulately, but you get my <laughs> point. What was your level and how much were you responsible for? So I was senior management at that time. It was, I reported to the assistant city manager. And so there was one position between me and the top 
Mm-hmm. So I was mm-hmm. as high as I was going to get because there's only one person mm-hmm. who can occupy that seat. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, making over six figures at that time, in my career, you know, benefits package, you know, all of the things, you know, and, and government, you don't have stock options, but you have a deferred comp plan that they you put money mm-hmm. in. So all the typical things just from, from the government side and things were still not, you know, great at that time. The, um, if you were, a, you know, if you were in leadership and you were, adamant about a point, you know, you're labeled as aggressive. And that happens if you're a woman, it happens even more so that trope of being the angry Latina. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. I had witnessed my boss slamming his hand on the table, screaming, throwing the chalk at the board. And that was all impassioned. Mm-hmm. If I held to my point and refused to back down, I, I am angry. Mm-hmm. And I'm mm-hmm. not a team player. And, mm-hmm. you know, all of those things. So it's like I had fought to get my seat at the table, but I had to be very judicious in how I used that seat at the mm-hmm. table. Mm-hmm. So I was a consummate learner of communication and language mm-hmm. and body language and intonation and all of the things that go mm-hmm. into communicating a point because I had to be, mm-hmm. because I had to ensure that not only did I help my you know, cisgendered heterosexual white male counterparts feel comfortable mm-hmm. before I could levy my point. I couldn't come across as aggressive. I couldn't come across as overbearing. I had to really, really parse my words, but do it in such a way that I didn't offend. I didn't make someone feel uncomfortable, but I also needed to be heard. So it was this dance of how do I bring to their attention the faux pas <laughs> that are happening in our organization or in our community without igniting the shame, blame, uncomfortable feelings that someone might feel if they've had a misstep. Mm-hmm. So it was a constant, constant battle and of, you know, in a world where we're told like, you know, screw what people think of you, like, you know, just do what you want to do. Well, that's great, except for I can't do that because I, you know, also government perception, I'm a senior official. So I can't even put something on my Facebook page if I want to without drawing ire from the community. So it was a constant uh, battle of like almost shrinking who I am and what I have to say, but trying to get a point across, but in the most meek and sheepish way possible. So as not to, you know, upset the apple cart too much. It's like, so how do we disrupt the status quo if I have to protect and preserve the status quo in order to maintain my seat at the table? Because the threat of that seat going away was ever present. Like if Mm -hmm. you make somebody uncomfortable, you're not going to be invited to the next meeting. You know, Cindy, this is is such a compelling conversation. It reminds me of the episode of the Mindset Rx that I did on the Harvard Business Review article earlier this year. The title of that was Stop Telling Women That They Have the Imposter Syndrome. And the thesis of that article is illustrated in your point here, which is that um, the system and structure that you're living in sets up the conditions for those who are not of the majority to feel like an imposter. As you describe your experience, I'm curious what was your experience with the imposter syndrome? Yeah, I constantly questioned whether or not I even belonged there. You know, and throughout my career on the climb to that seat, I had done a lot of things to ensure that I assimilated as much as possible, mm-hmm. including, you know, taking my curly hair and putting back in a bun the majority of the time so that it was up and away and not considered ethnic in any way. You know, and you know, I'm multilingual, but ensuring that I speak English very articulately without any hint of a Spanish accent, so as not to draw the criticism over my command of the language, thereby insinuating that I must be not as smart as someone else, which the mm-hmm. contrary we all know is true. The more languages you speak, the more of your brain that you use. Right. But in this country in particular, uh, I can't speak for other countries because I don't live there, but in this country in particular, we tend to frown upon people who speak English with an accent. Mm -hmm. It's some of that crazy nationalism that we have going on in our country. But so 
just understanding that I was constantly questioning whether I had done enough to get there. And knowing in the position I was in, you know, in the senior leadership position over uh, controlling the finances of the entire organization, I knew what my counterparts in the same positions made. And so knowing that for decades, I am me and the other women, so it was not just me, were paid much less for the same level of authority than our white male counterparts. Mm -hmm. And making the fight to like, you know, to improve that over the years and having to make the case and constantly, it was, it is, it was a battle of constant, like, am I doing the right thing? You know, I don't want to do anything to risk my position because if I'm ousted for upsetting the apple cart, then I can't help anybody behind me. Right. Right. But if I assimilate too much now that I'm inside, I'm still cutting off opportunity for the people behind me because now I've just shown them that, you know, not, am I being a sellout? Mm -hmm. Have I mm -hmm. just adopted, you know, the way of my oppressor so that I don't get you know, mm -hmm. kicked out? Mm -hmm. So oppressor syndrome is very real. Very real. And the experience I think that you bring in, I think a lot of our listeners are going to relate to in some way, understand in others, and hopefully be enlightened and have their eyes open to the experiences that are going on behind the scenes. Because not it's what I said recently was it's like Ginger Rogers said about Fred Astaire. She said, I do everything he does except backwards and high heels. And that sounds, <laughs> that sounds so glamorous, but when you think about the psychology, the stress, the ongoing chronic stress that you would have in order to just show up at your work every day, is it any wonder that right now we're in the middle of the great resignation and there are women who are, and other people too, but there are women who are leaving these leadership position in droves. In fact, one of the companies that I'm working with now and in, into 2022 is real concerned about, yeah, at every level people are leaving, but the, 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 boat, the ones who really rock the boat, who really are a blow to the organization is when women leave and women of color leave. It is one of the most challenging things they're telling me for the people who stay. So yeah, they're, I don't have, listen, as usual, we don't have any, like, how to do right. things. I don't have a solution. Like, yeah. I don't, <laughs> but I think that, you know, knowledge and awareness is one of those places that we can operate at now. So let's flash forward to today, because you've been out of that field for a while. Mm -hmm. I know that you're coaching uh, people who are in that, in those spaces, just as I am. And that's one of our points of intersection here. From where, from your vantage point now, what's, what are some of the things you would have told your past self who was sitting at the table? How would you support yeah. her? Well, one, I would have probably told a former version of myself that you didn't have to stay as long as you did. Oof. And, you know, I left in 2018 and, you know, in large part by the support of my husband who you know, it was a lifetime entrepreneur. And he was like, screw that place, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and I had not been, I had, you know, worked all of those years, right? I had done all the right things and the blood, sweat and tears that had gone into that. But I would just reassure myself that, that it's okay, that you can do something different and you can be successful in a different way. And life doesn't have to look how anybody else has like described it, envisioned it for you. Mm -hmm. And I would just like hold that space for me to really feel into that because mm -hmm. the pressure of leaving and doing something different. And, you know, I think part of that, at least for me, was our identity can get wrapped up in what we do for a living, and especially in this country. The first question that someone will ask you is, so what do you do? Why? Because we're about to assign the level of respect to you that we believe you deserve based on your given job title, mm -hmm. based on how you describe yourself. And so the thought of no longer being like in charge, I, you know, my kids when they were little used to say, mommy has a big job. She has a big job. She talks to the mayor <laughs> you know, and she goes to the White House. And yes, it was a big job. 
And Mm -hmm. I loved being able to see the fruit of what I did play out in the community that I was blessed to serve. And as hard as it was, it was also like a blessing. I got to do a lot of amazing things in my career. But looking back at the level of stress, like that you mentioned that I undertook during that time, you know, was, was tremendous. And of course, you know, there's still healing that has to come from that. You know, you do work with the healing, the corporate trauma, Mm -hmm. which is real. Um, It's very real because that lives in your body and you've now built an identity around that trauma in order to either preserve yourself or preserve others or whatever the case is. But just telling myself that you have permission, give yourself permission Mm -hmm. to do something different. Cause I didn't give myself permission because I had like made it right. I literally had a corner office with a view of downtown. That's literally where I sat windows on two sides, you know, like, so it's kind of funny that, you know, the joke is, Oh, get the corner office with the view. I had Mm -hmm. that. And then a personal assistant and the, you know, the staff and all the things, but it really wasn't fulfilling to my soul because I couldn't bring my whole self to work every day. I had to bring the version of me that was palatable to those who got to decide whether or not I could stay. And I want to only be places where I am embraced in my entirety Mm -hmm. and that no one else ever gets to decide whether I stay or go, except Mm -hmm. for me. If you could see, if you're listening to the podcast, I've got probably tears in my eyes just to give you, it just, that just touched my heart so much because when I'm listening to you, Cindy, I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about other people, regardless of gender, who have had these experiences of being in that blood, sweat, and tears, soul draining, soul sucking job. From the outside looking in, you've made it. Your kids are proud of you. You've got the big job. You get to go to DC, to the White House, and so on. And yet inside, your soul's dying. Mm-hmm. And it occurs to me to go back to our question is now that you've broken through the glass ceiling, now what do you do? Do you propagate the status quo or do you do something different? There's a concept that's called Stockholm syndrome and it's where the, the traumatized, the, the, I always think about this is, I'm so dating myself, but I remember as a little girl when Patty Hearst was kidnapped. I don't know yes, if you remember, I remember that, that story. Too. I was so <laughs> compelled. I was like, I don't even know how old I was. I was old enough to know mm-hmm. about it. And I was so compelled by it, but she actually took on, you know, she took the side of her captor. Of her captor, and yeah. I, and I think that I'm not saying that everybody who, every woman who's sitting at the table in in corporate land has Stockholm syndrome, but there is kind of a level of, um, I'm going to be shoulder to shoulder with these people who, even though I'm enduring this ongoing, even micro trauma, the daily micro traumas that we experience. I'm going to keep going because of the outcomes that I'm able to produce as though the ends justify the means. Right. So it occurs to me to answer our question about now that we're here, now what? I think that from my end, healing corporate trauma, healing the trauma and making sure that you are fully you internally and you bring your best self to the table. I don't know if I have to bring my whole self to the table every day, I don't know if people actually want to see me first thing in the morning with my bed head. And, <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to be able to share my gifts, talents, my contributions in the best way possible, if that makes sense. So I think that, that that's my perspective on that. And obviously everybody's going to have a different take on bringing how much of yourself you bring to work. But to your point, you shouldn't have to hide who you are either. Correct. And I think for me, what that means, you know, coming from a marginalized community. And, you know, I think the bringing your whole self to work from any of your marginalized communities, like, and, you know, and I get it as being a member of a marginalized community, mimicking the patterns of the dominant community is something you think you have to do because you're like, okay, well, they're not seeing me, hearing me or doing it, you know, I'm not making any headway. So let me mimic those ways mm-hmm. so that I can be seen, heard, felt, you know, and if you think on, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Like, you know, the base levels of what people need before you can be more advanced. Yeah. And you need to be safe. You need to feel safe. And the safest way to be in, a, a, I'll, I'm doing air quotes, but in a foreign mm-hmm. community is to look like them, talk like them, be as exactly. much like them, even if you look or are completely different, different from them. So yes, 
and I want to take time out here because mm -hmm. I am cisgendered. I am white. I am female. I, I have a lot of power. I'm educated. And I know that about myself. And I think it's important to say, you know, I'm an educated white girl. So I have a different relationship with power than my sisters and brothers who are further from the center of privilege and power. My, I will just say, I think that people who look like me are part of the problem. Not, I'm, you can see me treading water here a little bit, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll back up and just tell a story. I taught multicultural counseling as a graduate student at the University of Kansas. I, and I taught it with my mentor, Barb Kerr, who's also white and educated. And so we had two white girls teaching multicultural counseling. The hardest people for us to teach were the people who look like us because they were the ones who were saying, I don't see what the problem is. Why do we have to keep having these conversations? I don't have that experience. And you can see their level of awareness around yeah. distance from power and privilege. So for my people, the people who look like I do, I think that we have a special responsibility because we have a voice that other people do, they do have, but they're not able to necessarily use it in the same way that we can. I said recently to my neighbor who's Latina, she's a leader, she's got all kinds of things going on in the DNI space. And I told her about the, the podcast that I did on Stop Telling Women That We Have the Imposter Syndrome. And I said, I really had a lot to say to my, to my white male colleagues who are often sitting at, power, at the Center of Power and Privilege. And she said, and you can do that and I can't. I 100%, 100% you can do it. And I can't, you know, I don't look like you. <laughs> I don't present, you know, I don't, I'm not white passing, I'm not even close. Um, you know, Afro Latina and indigenous, like I, I can't be further from yeah. the center. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, you know, and of course I, I, I feel people's briars already getting up, you know, because people really struggle to have these conversations and acknowledge power mm -hmm. and privilege. And we all, experience privilege in different ways. In my own community, in the Latin community, I would have privilege because I'm able to speak, I'm able to pass around, and you may have something valuable to say that my community will reject based on what you look like mm -hmm. because of the experiences they've had with people who present like you. Yeah, I will say so that. You know, we all possess privilege in some way. So whoever's, yeah. if, you're, if you're hearing the word privilege and you're trying to make it a pejorative term. It is not a pejorative. Mm -hmm. If we can't acknowledge where we sit in the hierarchy, and for those who try to pretend that this country was not built by and for the white man, then you didn't read the constitution because it absolutely was. And you know, even white women got the right to vote mm -hmm. before someone like me. It was years mm -hmm. later that someone who looks like me could then enjoy that privilege. So when we talk about, you know, the, the foundations of a country and epigenetics and all of those good things, right? All of that is real. And my ability to hold to account someone who sits closer to the center of privilege is not the same. Right. And yes, so that's where we can lend our privilege and lend our power to other people. It's kind of like if you think in the branding space, right? Or, you know, visibility. I do large publications. And so someone writing for entrepreneur or success.com or fast company, you are boring the good brand visibility of that publication. It automatically mm -hmm. elevates you yeah. because you're writing for this large publication in the space of, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. The same holds true. Mm -hmm. I can borrow from Robin some, form of privilege or elevation of status if robin is willing to say hey here's the thing you mm -hmm. know my friend cindy this 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 or even more importantly robin is willing to stand in the gap when there's an issue mm -hmm. when she notices that her counterpart is you know prickling up she can call it out mm -hmm. and say hey hey, hey oh. wait a second this is what yeah. we're not going to do I so, can't say, hey, 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 wait a second. No, you can't. And we want to get to a point, and I really, truly, with all my heart, believe that this is where we are headed. When we oh, talk about the long vision, this is what we're talking about, is that 
the elevation of consciousness and the shifts that we're making and the inroads that we're making are going to have lasting effects on our generation, but on the coming generations as well, in terms of how we use our seats at the table for good, every single one of us. And I think that also using your seat at the, at the table for good, now that you've got it yeah. means for my group, for I'm, I can't, I'm aware what I'm doing here, which is I'm speaking for <laughs> white straight women mm-hmm. who are married and educated and have these seats at the table. It's, it's from my perspective, it's, it's, it's our, my group's responsibility to educate and to speak and to use our voices because we can. And then to yield power and privilege to open doors and say yes, not to just to acknowledge that there it's there and we have a responsibility to make sure that that shifts. That's one thing that that I know that my group can do. What occurs to you as I say that? And I mean, I, hate, and I have to I say, agree. I have to say my group, I'm using air quotes, yeah. my group, that's it's such a generalization. And I'm aware of that. But I want to also be succinct in terms of actually what I think. Right. And understanding that the points of intersectionality are many. And mm-hmm. so no group is a monolith. Just like, you know, mm-hmm. I happen to be, you know, Afro-Latina, which means I'm from Puerto Rico, you know, and so this is an Afro-Latina community. Some people don't even like to use the term Latina in our in our world or Hispanic, depending upon where your ethnicity comes from, all these things. So acknowledging the intersectionalities and no group is a monolith, including, you know, the cisgender heterosexual white male, it's not a monolith either. Right. But Absolutely. speaking in generalities is how we're going to move forward because the, the problems that we have wouldn't persist if the majority of those groups didn't act and perpetuate in you know, certain right. behaviors. And so, yes, everyone wants to see themselves as an exception, which is part of the problem, <laughs> but I holding the space for people who don't look like you to move into those spaces and then to be able to maneuver in those spaces. Cause it's one thing to get in. It's something else to be able to maneuver that space in the same way. And understanding that even for myself, you know, I'm, I'm being, I speak fluent English. I have an advanced degree as well. I'm married. You know, I have intersectionalities that afford me some privilege that others don't have, you know, understanding our, our, you know, LGBTQIA community, you know, is an issue. So the more intersectionalities you have that take you the further away from the mm-hmm. center of the privilege, center. Mm-hmm. the more challenging it becomes. And for myself, because I'm a member of a marginalized community, what I want to say is it does not absolve me from the work. Mm. It does not absolve me from understanding internalized, um, you know, uh, bigotry or misogyny or patriarchy or any of those things that I may have internalized through my lifetime because I had to assimilate in order to survive. I have to peel back those layers and I have to look at my, my language around ableism and gender and all of these things because if I continue to perpetuate the way I see things and use my privilege as it exists, then I'm also part of the problem. So you open a door for me and then I can open a door for people who maybe look like me, but don't sound like me. In other words, they are, you know, brown, but they have an accent or they are a brown, have an accent and they are not cisgendered. Mm -hmm. And so understanding, or they're brown, have an accent, not cisgendered and in a wheelchair, you know, or deaf or blind, like, you know, that understanding that so many intersectionalities but yes, the closer you are to that center of privilege, I feel like the greater responsibility you have to prop the door open, don't repair the glass ceiling, maybe put a put a, a door in or just a hole that people would just walk up and down through. And then also you have to be the hostess with the mostess when they're there. By it's really true. Around it's around. It's and really true. Them through, navigate. Being the hostess the with the mostest, that's the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the tea party, right, that we're yeah. bringing in, the little girl tea party. But I, I, so there's a lot of work. We know that that's true. Mm-hmm. I want us to, will you do some future visioning with me as Absolutely. we end our, so I want to just go forward in time. Let's go to, what year do you want to go to? 2025, 2026. Sure, All right, so let me age myself. Okay, got it. Okay. 
So everyone just go forward in time, four years, three years, 2025, 2026. So this will be 40 years, right? No, 30 years after you were told to use your sex appeal. What does your future self have to say? How are things different for her? My future self says that you would get to embrace all of the assets that you were endowed with. Hmm. Just like I can't hide what color my skin is, I can't hide what I look like. Hmm. And if that is a form of privilege that I possess, because it is very much a form of privilege, then I need to use it to yes. open a door, to advance the cause and help someone who doesn't possess the privilege that I possess purely based on my birthright. So it's no different than being born into a certain nation, being born to a certain ethnicity or nationality. Like I, I was also blessed to be born an American, right? What a privilege. I wasn't born in Syria or North Korea. I didn't do anything to earn that. It just is. And so I would say to my future, or my future self will say, thank you for all of the privilege that I possess. Thank you for the awareness of the ways in which I can utilize that privilege. And thank you for always being open to critical feedback from someone who, ha who has intersectionalities that are different from mine, being able to mirror to me what I'm missing. Mm -hmm. And to accept that with love and grace and say, thank you so much for letting me know that there is a way that I can help that I'm not helping. And then I need to go do the work to make sure that it helps. Mm -hmm. And also understanding that I'm never going to put that burden on that marginalized community to teach me what I need to do different, that I'm going to go do that work mm -hmm. and do it happily and not do it for a cookie or a star, but because, you know, it, in the, in the collective, we are all one anyway. And so I want to help usher that in, in the actual 3d space that we live in. Beautiful. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us today on Mindset Rx. It's just so thought provoking. And I always know when I have conversations with you that we're gonna go deep and we're gonna go broad and we're gonna talk about things that matter in our hearts and our minds and our organizations as well. So thank you so much for being here. I'm Dr. Robin McKay, this is Mindset Rx and please join us next week. If you are watching the recording or listening to the podcast, reach out and let us know what you think of this episode. And if you really loved it, share it with your communities. I think this is the most important thing that we can do to get messages like Cindy's out into the world and to start making ripples and waves as we do the work to shift the, the spirit and the culture of our organizations. Until next time, see you later.